My name is Sarah Rorick and I'm a parent here with two kids in Wakefield Public Schools. I'm also the chair of the Wakefield Parent Partnership and run a lecture series here. Um, before I introduce Ben Rowe, the director of Heiblitz International Music Institute, I would like to extend a huge thank you to everyone who has made this possible. Four years ago, my grandmother, Connie Andrews, who is here today, um, invited me to my first Typhus on Tour concert at the Jamestown Arts Center in Jamestown, Rhode Island. I remember being mesmerized by the music's, musician's passion and technique. My husband and I had never seen musicians play classical music like they did, and it got me to thinking maybe we could bring Typhus on Tour to Wakefield. Thanks to this fabulous community who cares deeply about their music programs and works wonders to make things happen, we are here today. I am deeply grateful to our superintendent, Kim Smith, Tom Banker, the director of Wakefield's Visual Performing Arts Department, Wakefield Music Boosters, and Ben Rowe, director of Hyphus, for believing that we can make this event happen. I am also extremely grateful to the team of people who have helped me put this together, including Caroline Lieber, Ann Miller, Jane O'Keefe, Tom Banker, TJ White, Jen McDonald, and the families who are hosting musicians, and the many volunteers we have here today. I'm extremely grateful to all of our sponsors who, list, who are listed on the back of your programs. I would especially like to recognize Wakefield Education Foundation, the Boys and Girls Clubs of Stoneham and Wakefield, and the Wakefield Cultural Council for this, er, their incredible financial support for this residency and series of events. Please take a look at the back page of your program for a complete list of sponsors. Our speaker today is Ben Rowe, director of Heifetz International Music Institute, who is a former director of classical services at WGBH Boston. Please stay for a reception after the concert, and we would greatly appreciate any donations you can provide to us at the end of this concert. So please give us a warm welcome to Benjamin Rowe. Thank you so much, Sarah, and so nice to see you all here today. It does indeed take a village, and I have to say, it was, I was stunned to walk in. I thought I knew a little bit about Wakefield, living in the Boston area for many years, but I was stunned to walk in here uh, and see this incredible auditorium, and knowing a little bit about what it costs to put such a facility together is truly an impressive effort. I think it underscores the commitment that this town has to the arts and culture, and I hope that we don't disappoint you today of being one of the very few uh, and one of the very first performers or groups, I guess I would say, to come in here and uh, try out this space with an afternoon of chamber music. Now, I was in the broadcasting business for a long time, and one thing you learn in the broadcasting business is, besides adjusting the height of microphones, there you go, uh, is that you always have to ask the question that's on people's minds. So you almost have to act as an interlocutor for uh, the person that is listening on the or watching uh, on the other side of the screen or on the radio. Uh, so the first question that's on a lot of people's minds when they hear about the Heifetz International Music Institute, well, at my old job at WGBH, not long ago, we produced a documentary called God's Fiddler and talked about the great violinist of the 20th century, in many people's opinion, Yasha Heifetz. No connection. <laughs> Actually, there is a connection. Uh, but uh, the Heifetz International Music Institute is named after Daniel Heifetz, uh, not Yasha. Daniel had a fine concert career in his own right. He was a medalist at the Tchaikovsky uh, International Violin Competition uh, and uh, had quite a solo career. More on that in a minute. Uh, Daniel and Yasha are actually cousins. Uh, they're both, uh, Yasha of course spent many years uh, teaching in Los Angeles and Daniel was actually born and raised in Beverly Hills 90210. Uh, his father was a very prominent uh, neurosurgeon at Cedar Mount Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles. Daniel first picked up a violin at the age of five and clearly had some talent. Uh, so much talent that Yasha Heifetz invited young Daniel to study with him. 
Now, most people don't turn down, in his time, did not turn down Yasha Heifetz. Uh, so Daniel had an audition with Yasha. Yasha invited him to be his student. And Daniel uh, was prescient to imagine that it's probably not a good idea and would never escape the shadow of the elder Heifetz if he agreed to be his student. So instead, uh, at the age of 15, he uh, booked himself a ticket and flew across the country to the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, which at the time was uh, headed by Ephraim Zimbalist. This is Ephraim Zimbalist Sr., not the one who was in the FBI, uh, but his father, who was also a great violinist and the head of the Curtis Institute. Daniel showed up sort of unannounced um, and got an audition with Ephraim Zimbalist. Uh, and Ephraim Zimbalist, he went back to his uh, hotel room, was preparing to go back to uh, Los Angeles, uh, and Zimbalist called him up and said, come back, I want to listen to you again. And after he listened to him again, he said, it's the middle of the semester, my studio is full, who do you think you are? You start Monday. <laughs> uh, and Daniel indeed uh, went on to study with Zimbalist and uh, and the other great teachers at Curtis. And one thing, if you don't know about the Curtis Institute of Music, is once you're in, you're in, and it's essentially it's a free ride. It's full tuition. They sort of decide. They take fewer than 200 students. So once you're admitted to Curtis, it's basically uh, tuition free. Uh, Daniel went on to study in the summertime uh, at Kneisel Hall in Maine uh, with Zimbalist and the other faculty from Curtis who decamp there in the summertime. Uh, and then went on to have his career. Daniel's always been a little bloody-minded, and in uh, that that Tchaikovsky competition, that uh, he did uh, win a medal at the Tchaikovsky competition, only instead of pocketing the prize money and uh, phoning home about it, uh, he went across town and donated the money to the uh, Soviet dissident Refusnik Natan Sharansky. This did not sit him in good stead with the Soviet authorities. Uh, but actually a state dinner was thrown in his honor because the attention that it gave to Sharansky and his plight it's so interesting now that, you know, in our generation here in the 21st century, we forget about the fact that there were such names as refuseniks and dis dissidents. But in the Soviet Union, uh, you know, it was very difficult ever to leave there. And if you were Jewish, as they would say, forget about it. So uh, with this work, it actually got Sharansky freed, uh, and Sharon Sharansky is now living in uh, Israel. Uh, so anyway, Daniels went on to have kind of a, a maverick bit of a career. And uh, when he got to the point where um, later in his career, about 20 years ago, he found himself uh, looking around at the way that music was being taught at conservatories and finding that there was something wrong with what was happening. What I admire about Daniel is one of the very first people to look at the state of classical music, and of course a lot of people wring their hands about the state of classical music, and instead of saying, the problem is with all of you. Why aren't you coming to our concerts? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with education? All valid points, perhaps, but Daniel was one of the very first people to say, maybe the problem is here. Maybe the way that we are communicating it, the way that we are expressing it, needs some attention. Uh, 20 years ago, this was a radical notion. Uh, 20 years later, it's still kind of a radical notion, uh, which is really what the Heifetz Institute is all about. Now, there are lots of summertime festivals. There are lots of summertime music camps, there's lots of summertime gatherings of great musicians. You only need to look here in New England, sort of the cradle of it, with Tanglewood and with Marlboro and Yellow Barn. I mentioned Kneisel Hall, uh, Monadnock Music and Apple Hill. There's all these great uh, summer festivals and institutions. Um, there's only one Hyphus Institute, which is uh, what we do differently is that it really is kind of a cauldron of communication. The idea being that we bring in the same great faculty. In fact, we have a lot of faculty from the England Conservatory, from Juilliard, from Curtis, Cleveland Institute of Music and Peabody, teach the students in the morning. But the afternoon is, is devoted to something that we call the Daniel uh, Pioneer 20 years ago called communication training. And the idea behind that is that to be a great artist, not only do you have to play all the notes right, which is what they teach you at NEC and other places brilliantly, but you also need to learn about the emotional component of the music. And the emotional component of the music is really what has been left behind so often. One thing I always say to people is that every single piece of music that you hear on stage was written for a reason. 
there was, a, uh, there was a point of view that the composer wanted to share. There was a reason that they were so motivated to spend the time and the practice and discipline to write it down. What is that? It isn't all intellectual. There's actually a huge emotional component to it as well. It isn't just like Brahms writing about his love for Clara Schumann. On every single piece of music, there is an emotional core to it as well. What we try to do at the Hyvis Institute is find ways to help young performers really bring out that emotional core to really release their own personalities at the same time. So when a student comes to the Hyvis Institute, the very first thing that happens is very, very competitive. We take fewer than 100 students. We have, we have four to five times that many that apply, and they all play at a very, very high level. There's probably no more, I would say, than 5% who are just wholly unqualified. They all play at an extremely high level, violin, viola, and cello. But the difference is, when they come to the Hyphus Institute and they're admitted, the very first thing they have to do is walk into an auditorium like this, which is dark, save for two or three people. It might be Daniel Heifetz and uh, a, a teacher. Uh, I got to sit in last year for my first summer. Uh, the student comes in and they're st supposed to play their audition piece, which students are quite used to. So they come in and they play you know, maybe the introduction in Rondo Capriccioso by Saint-Saëns, and it's meant to dazzle us. And they play it. And then after a couple minutes, Daniel will stop them and say, that was really great. Now, would you please sing it? You should see the blood drain out of their faces at that point. <laughs> These students, many of the times, have never been asked to sing something. They have to play something. Uh, but all of our communication training begins with the premise that if you can't sing it, you can't play it and to really understand a piece of music, you need to have it so internalized that you can sing it. So you see the halting attempts at singing. Then you see the halting attempts when he asks them to play a scale with exuberance or to play a C major scale with despair or to play it like you're in love. And they look at him like he just landed from Mars. What do you mean? It's a scale. No, there's actually ways that you can play that piece of music that conveys something to you. So we begin our t training in the summertime on the six-week festival after you have your morning classes and master classes and lectures and, and, and coachings um, with your professors in the afternoon, you're devoted to classes in voice and then classes in public speaking, learning how to speak to people that are both in the front row as well as to look at the people that are in the back row trying not to pay attention because if you're a performer, you've got to make sure that you're touching everybody in the audience. We give them lessons on how they walk on and off stage. We move into discussions of movement. If you think about it, you're playing a cello or a violin or a viola, it's a wooden box. How do you make that wooden box a part of you? How do you make it uh, convey and extend uh, whatever it is that you're trying to get across? How does it become a, a, a living, breathing part of you and not some inanimate object that you have to carry around bulkily on stage? Uh, we bring in Broadway choreographers to help with movement. We then bring in Broadway actors and directors uh, to talk about uh, freedom of expression. They actually take some lessons in improvisation. They take lessons in how you move about on stage, you know, and, and how you block. Anybody that's been in theater is familiar with this. It's something that is usually wholly new to classical musicians, understanding how you fit on stage and in, in uh, reaction and opposition to some of the other performers on stage as well. As you watch our performance today, you watch their interaction in a way I think that you will find um, quite um, surprising and different from a lot of classical music concerts. We spend modules on health and wellness because uh, all of these musicians, we want them to have long careers. And just like talking about tennis or, or watching uh, baseball pitchers having Tommy John surgery when they're 14 years old, uh, you know, you have to be prepared for the long haul. And it's not that you're going, you're going to avoid injuries, but you're also going to learn how to manage and mitigate uh, those types of things, that, those aches and pains that can come up during the course of a performance. And of course, what you eat and uh, how you exercise and how you move um, has a great deal to do with that. This is a generative experience, the educators say, so that all of these different components, week after week, add up to uh, creating a very different effect. In fact, we videotape, and you know, I'll play for you a little example of what happens when you first come to the Institute, what happens six weeks later um, as you learn to take on all of these new skills about really not becoming the next Yo-Yo Ma, becoming the next you. 
uh, finding the own aspects of your personality, and then doing something that is very, very scary, particularly if you're 16, 18 years old, which is really revealing yourself. Because for you to really understand and to convey the music, you have to reveal something of your, yourself in the process. Really uh, try to free yourself from all of those constraints. And it's so fascinating because I, I say this to you as a theoretical thing, but when you see the videotapes of somebody who comes in like this, all constricted and, and kind of scared, having to speak in front of an audience, and then what happens six weeks later, it, it is truly something that can be miraculous. Now, we, there's a cauldron for this to happen, too. We, we talk about this theoretically, and we give them practice, but uh, there really is that kind of crucible of live performance. So in the course of the six weeks at the Hyvis Institute in Virginia, we do no fewer than 40 concerts, uh, because uh, we can talk about this in the classroom all you want, but you ha actually have to come out and do it on stage in front of an audience and see how they react and work on those skills. And so the next day, they'll get their notes from perhaps it might be Paul Katz from Juilliard, who was uh, from NEC, of course, who was one of our professors last year, can give the, can give the student notes about uh, his or her performance, but also the communication teacher might tell them about the way that they spoke or the way they moved on stage. So they're really trying to absorb all of these things together to learn about how to become a complete uh, performer. The extension of this kind of crucible of life performance is what you will see this afternoon because we're still in this kind of nice summertime bubble like Tanglewood or some other place where uh, it's very nice, the weather's very nice and people are all together. Uh, we do take some of our outstanding alums on the road. Coming here to Wakefield is a great example. It's not just coming to play for all of you as much as we like that, but it's also learning how those communication skills can apply to really building a career. So what happens when you have to go play for a group of second graders? Actually, second graders are easy. High schoolers, that's a challenge. <laughs> We, I, I tell our students that on any given day on these tours, which take, for, take place for about a week, and by the way, the parents love it because we actually pay them. You know, and so instead of paying for the lessons and everything else, they actually get some money back. Um, they could either be playing for kindergartners or they could be playing for millionaires. And oftentimes the kindergartners are better behaved. <laughs> uh, but what we do with this communication training also extends to what you'll actually see here uh, on the concert stage too. Uh, the whole concept of this, and we're always kind of tweaking it, uh, are ways that we can kind of break down those barriers of that come up between the audience and the performers on stage. So for example, what you see here is more marked by what you don't see, like any music stands, like any chairs. And we do have a bench for the cellist, but the cellist even has a, a raised platform. We require all of our performers, other than the cellist, and I guess the pianist, to stand when they perform. We think that that creates better focus, we think that creates better communication, and frankly, we think it creates better interest for you in the audience. Uh, in the first half, you're going to see only one instance of using a music stand when two people play together. The rest of the time, the music is all memorized because again, it breaks down some of those barriers between the performer and the audience. This microphone is here because we will ask every one of our, our students to help to introduce the piece and it helps them kind of understand a little bit about the historical context of the music once they've had a chance to think about not only internalizing but having to share that knowledge with all of you uh, in an audience. So uh, Heifetz concert is something uh, rather different and you know, I, I have a background in broadcasting as some of you know. Uh, we also do one of those things that used to be uh, a complete shibboleth but uh, in this one program you're going to hear nine or ten different pieces uh, so we unhesitatingly play movements sometimes, and Daniel Heifetz says he likes to cut out the boring bits. So um, this is not a concert to come and uh, sit down and watch a, a bunch of people sawing away at their instruments, as nice as that can be, but really meant to engage you more with the incredible, timeless joy and beauty that is inherent uh, in this music. So I think I'm gonna take a moment now and just run a short video for you that will tell you a little bit more of the Institute and then we will be uh, ready to start our concert. So, Maestro, are we ready? Every summer, about six dozen students from all over the globe make their way to Stanton, Virginia, to participate in a program like no other in the world, the Heifetz International Music Institute. 
They've barely had time to unpack their bags and get over their jet lag before, one by one, they tackle what is perhaps their most daunting performance of the summer, a solo opening evaluation before founder and artistic director Daniel Heifetz and a small handful of teachers and staff. This is a performance like no other in their young lives. To be sure, they have to play. But then they have to sing. And talk about the music. Uh, like a feeling of like wonder in the beginning. It's like, you know, no words going kind of feeling. And even play a scale, not to dazzle, but to convey an emotion, in this case, exuberant joy. And so begins the summer at the Heifetz Institute. In the morning, it's private lessons, master classes, and chamber music coachings with some of the most prominent faculty from some of the most prestigious conservatories in the world. In the afternoons, it's Heifetz performance and communication training, lessons in public speaking and presentation, voice lessons, movement and dance, health and wellness, drama and improvisation, and finally, freedom of expression learning how to combine all these elements with high-level performance to become a confident, communicative performer. And every night, Heifetz concert goers get to witness these bright young artists synthesize what they've learned and emerge anew. Six weeks and 40 concerts later, Heifetz Institute students discover that their approach to their art, and in many cases, their lives, has been transformed by their summer in the Shenandoah. They've learned the importance of revealing themselves to their audience. To communicate the message of the music they are creating from within. Playing music must transcend merely playing the notes. They must engage in the deeper, truer meaning of their art. <laughs> that every note needs to carry a full weight of purpose. how even the simplest of scales can inspire. In this small corner of the Shenandoah Valley, a new paradigm is being forged for the future of classical music, where conservatory standards of discipline and excellence meet the energy and creativity of an R&D lab. And this means a reinterpretation of the traditional concert experience, how it's programmed, how it's presented, and even where it happens. Not to mention what is being performed. We're discovering how differing musical genres can ignite the performances and bring out the personalities of these highly trained young artists. It's a brand new world of creative possibilities in the most timeless of art forms.
But right now, it's time for us to enjoy, after the screen goes up, Hype It's On Tour. Thanks very much. Everybody. My name is Claire Bradford. Uh, today I'm joined by Carlos Avila. Um, what you just heard, oh, first of all, I'm 20 years old. I'm from Philadelphia. Um, what you just heard was the uh, prelude from Bach's C major cello suite. Um, I don't have much to say about it. I already played it. It's a gorgeous piece of music, and I love playing it for you. 
Um, the next piece that Carlos and I are going to play is two movements from Francois Francois' Sonata for possibly cello and piano. We don't know because nobody knows what instrument the sonata was written for. Um, it's a super fun piece. The first movement is uh, an adagio. It's a little contemplative in some ways. And the second movement is really light and joyful. Um, this past summer was my first summer at the Heifetz Institute. And um, we learned a lot of things there. And they had us do a lot of crazy communications classes where we did lots of different exercises. And we got all awkward in front of each other doing interpretive games. And um, I think that I'm learning a little bit this week that all that stuff was really awesome for me because I'm able to get up and perform for you guys and talk to you guys, which is the scariest thing ever. And uh, I'm not as scared as I was yesterday talking to you all. So thank you to the Hypus Institute for helping me with my public speaking. <laughs> um, I'm gonna stop talking now and I'm gonna play some more music for you, but I hope you all enjoy and thank you all for being Thank you. 
everyone. Uh, hello. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, my name is Rachel Wong. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and I go to Indiana University. Uh, I'm really excited. Me and Claire will be playing a set of fiddle tunes by my favorite Scottish fiddle duo, Alistair Fraser and Natalie Haas. Um, I'm always really excited whenever I get the chance to fiddle. Uh, this past summer at the Heifetz Institute, um, there was a new program that they started every Saturday night called the Heifetz Hootenannies, and <laughs> where the students, we'd all get to play other genres of music uh, besides classical. So um, I decided this was a good chance for me to explore my passion for Scottish fiddling since I actually am part Scottish, if you could tell. Uh, <laughs> um, the set that we're going to be playing, the tunes come from all over, like Edinburgh, Ireland, the Scottish Highlands, and even Cape Breton, so I hope you enjoy. Thank you. 
piece by the composer Amy Beach. Um, she's one of the most famous women composers in the music repertoire, I think, which is pretty rare to have a woman composer in general. Um, she was born in New Hampshire, but she actually lived a lot of her life in the Boston area, and a lot of her pieces were uh, first performed by the Boston Symphony. Um, the piece that we will be playing today uh, she dedicated to the violinist Maud Powell, who is a very is a force of nature in her own right. She made it her mission to bring uh, to make it that women musicians could practice and not feel the stigma that was behind being a woman musician in the time. And I'd like to think that I play the violin partly because of her. Uh, this piece. Amy Beach wrote for the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, and it said that they played it through and the crowd demanded that they play it again. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, I hope you enjoy Romance by Amy Beach. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Wakefield. My name is Matt Cohen. I was born in Santa Monica, California, and grew up in Portland, Oregon, and I now live in New York City and study at the Juilliard School. Um, I couldn't be happier to be here today to share my music with you. Um, so something that my friends have probably mentioned is that a really cool, unique thing about the Heifetz Institute is that we give these talks before we play, which I think sometimes to musicians can be a little terrifying, <laughs> but um, I've always very much enjoyed the chance to, to share, share something human with the audience. So um, another great thing about the talks is that it makes me actually go learn something about the piece that I'm playing. So like, like any good student, um, doing their homework 30 minutes before it's due. Uh, <laughs> I looked up some information about this piece on my phone and didn't find much, except that the first review of it was not so great. It was, this piece is pretty nice, it's a little long, but, but you know, it's all right. Uh, which I think is very unfair and I, I very much think that it's a wonderful, beautiful piece uh, deserving of attention and respect. So the piece is called Elegy, which usually refers to loss, death, bereavement of some sort. But having gone through more breakups in my life than deaths, I tend to associate this piece much more with stormy romantic passion rather than uh, the grief of loss of life, which I think honestly is rather more fitting of the piece as well. It's very intense, very passionate, and it's quite a ride, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. Thank you very much for coming to this concert. Carlos, the pianist, and I um, will play the Isai variations on the Sansons theme um, on the form of waltz. waltz. This piece is brilliant and elegant. It starts as a fiery gesture and goes through a whole lot of things um, between very soft and pretty to very furious and virtuosic. Like many composers, such as uh, Niccolo Paganini, um, is I made this transition, um, and now Carlos and I are going to perform it. Thank you. 
tour. One thing that we do uh, that you heard uh, Sarah mention that this is sort of the kickoff to the next two days uh, we're going to be having our group here uh, performing with and listening to students from all over the Wakefield schools. They're also going to be at the Boys and Girls Club of Stoneham and Wakefield and uh, doing a master class with students of Caroline Lieber. So I think it's really going to be a great experience of what we do with Heifetz on tours, not just uh, doing performances, which they love to do, but also having a chance really to uh, interact and to sit with players and really help to encourage them uh, to think about pursuing uh, what they do um, and uh, not necessarily careers in music, but really sort of advanced uh, study. Now, what we do with these Heifetz on Tour programs, you've had the chance in the first half to hear the brilliant, and I hope you would agree, uh, virtuosity of our individual players. So they all have a chance to play some solo works, and you heard one um, duet between Claire and Rachel, uh, something that very much we encourage at the Institute. We encourage solo performances, and we also encourage chamber music. And the second half of the program is devoted to just that, to chamber music, the great works of literature, uh, in this case, uh, work by Franz Schubert, a work by Samuel Barber, which may surprise you, and a great piano quintet by Antonin Dvorak. So as much as we like to focus on the individual brilliance to play some of these pieces, like you heard that Isai by Daniel Eisenstadt, uh, it's also a chance for people to all get together and to learn that some people call the purest form of democracy is playing in a string quartet. And maybe you'll agree after you hear the performances. So uh, please enjoy the second half of this Heifetz on Tour program. Thanks. We have um, a piece that we memorize. Um, it's the Handel Harrison, uh, Pasakalia, for viola and violin.
piece we're going to play is the Adagio by Samuel Barber. Now, most of you may be most familiar with this work in the version for string orchestra, but the fact is, is that what we're doing is actually the original version, as the piece is the original second movement of Barber's string quartet. Interestingly enough, this piece has become very much associated as a sort of requiem. It's been played at the funeral of various famous individuals, including presidents Franklin D. Roosevelt, Princess Diana, and Albert Einstein. However, there's no such programmatic background to the piece. It simply fits very well. In any case, here's Barbara Zadaccio. Enjoy.
evening, everyone. My name is Carlos. I'm originally from California. I live in New York City now. I've lived there for 11 years. Um, this last piece we're going to play for you is the Dvorak Piano Quintet. The Piano Quintet is uh, it's sort of a, a rare medium for classical musicians. We're string quartets. There are literally hundreds of string quartets to choose from and so many great works. The Piano Quintet, a string quartet plus one piano, you would think is an extremely popular medium, but it's actually not. There are, there are really only about a handful, maybe five, six, seven pieces that are played in the entire lexicon of classical music. And lucky for you, we're playing the best one. <laughs> uh, just a, a little bit about uh, the piece. As you can see in your program, the third and fourth movements which we're playing, the third movement is titled a furiant. And uh, it's what I like to call a false cognate. It has nothing to do with the word furious, actually. It's, um, it's, in, it's Czech, and it's a type of dance, and it's a type of boisterous, joyful dance, so really the opposite of furious. And it's for two men and a woman, and the third, the third person is always trying to push in to the dance, so it's just kind of a, a playful game. And it's, all, it's usually preceded by what's called a dumka or a dumki. We hope you like this piece, it's one of our favorites. So. Thank you. 
Thank you.